Outdoor Explorer, and I'm your host, Martha Rosenstein. My guest today is Mark Kelly. Mark moved to Fairbanks from Buffalo, New York to attend college and with the hopes of finding out what it would be like to meet a whale. He's been photographing Alaska ever since. After getting his master's degree, he worked as a photojournalist for the Juno Empire and eventually went on to become a full-time wildlife photographer. He has won numerous awards for his work, including winning the portfolio category of the 2022 National Wildlife Magazine Photo Contest, which is how I found out about him. So welcome to Outdoor Explorer, Mark. Well, thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, I'm curious to know why you decided to come all the way to Alaska from New York to meet a whale, because there's a lot of other places to do that. <laughs> Well, um, well, it was a dream of mine as a young man, a young boy, to, 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 to find a whale. And I never really thought about how I was going to do that. It was just always in the back of my head. And actually, I was working, um, I graduated from high school in Buffalo. And then I uh, dropped, went a year school and dropped out because it wasn't working for me at university. And I was working construction in Omaha, Nebraska, of all places. And it was 100 degrees most of the time and 100% humidity. And I was really tired of it. And I had a pickup truck and a couple of thousand dollars. And I headed to Alaska with no great plan. I had three eight-track tapes <laughs> and uh, ended up in Fairbanks and realized I was going to need a place to stay for the winter. So I enrolled at the University of Alaska of Fairbanks. Um, not, and I, my first year of college wasn't a great experience. So I was just thinking I'd get a good room and I was always this guy hiking around and I thought, oh, I'd just use that as my, uh, you know, base and explore, uh, Fairbanks in that area. And, uh, I ended up enrolling at the school and, uh, met, I took a photography class and I've been doing pictures on my own for a long time, um, at various levels in your book and stuff like that. And met a, I took a class from a very well-known professor named Jimmy Bedford. And at the end of the semester, he called me in and said, what are you doing with your life? And I said, I don't really have any idea. And he said, you know, why don't you sign up on my program, which was a photojournalism program through University of Alaska Fairbanks. And uh, I'll become your um, faculty advisor. And uh, at the end of your career, at the end of your, when you graduate, you will, I can guarantee you will have a job as a photographer on a newspaper someplace. And I never really thought about, it was too much fun taking pictures about actually, I, I mean, if I really thought about it, of course, people make money doing it, but I never thought about the financial. It was just, I enjoyed doing it. I said, sign me up. And he was right. When I graduated, I'd spend a year, um, a summer working at the Fairbanks News Miner and uh, Ken Sturgis, who was the editor at the time, said, don't go back to school. Don't finish up. Just stay and work with us. And I said, no, I wanted to finish school. And when I finally got out, I had multiple job offers. And so Jimmy Bedford was right. And so the power of one professor and a 10 minute conversation uh, changed my life. Amazing. And then uh, I end up uh, working my way down to Fair to Juno to work as the newspaper photographer here, and I spent 13 years as that. And then, uh, um, so that's how I got here, and that's one power, one professor. So, do you have where do we go from here? Uh, yeah. Um, I guess I could long, keep going. How long did it take you to meet your whale? <laughs> well, what was interesting was. I, I I had a really good time at Fairbanks. I, I ended up being a student firefighter. I don't know if you know much about Fairbanks, but the university they have it. They're outside the city fire limits. And back then, when I was going there in '74, the pipeline was just getting started, and I was in a dorm. And then almost everyone left. All the guys left to work on the pipeline. And um, the fire department got deserted. And usually you had to wait a couple of years to get in the fire department. And I got in the fire department like because I could breathe. And uh, and ended up spending four years there driving fire engines, running ambulances, really good stuff. And while I was doing that, I was taking pictures. And so, um, and actually, 
I was an engineer, which means you drive to the fire and you set up all the stuff, you get all the hoses going, you get the pumps going, and then you just kind of monitor stuff. And then I had time to take pictures. And of course, firefighters are vain and they like the pictures I was taking of them. Well, that set of pictures ended up in National Geographic's children magazine because here we are students and we were did a lot of uh, hands-on stuff, um, you know, with students coming through touring, you know, holding hoses, lame squirt and stuff. And uh, they ran six pictures of, of six pages of pictures of the University of Alaska Fairbanks and as a graduating senior. So I'd been published in National Geographic was pretty heady stuff, I thought. Um, yeah. And then also that was the first year I got the cover of Alaska magazine. And then I got in a National Geographic book. So it was like, well, this is pretty cool. Um, and then I actually, before I got to Fair, uh, Juno, I, I, I took a job in Ithaca, New York, working for the paper there. I had a job offer there and they had a really good, it was the first job, first, um, first time a photographer had been promoted all the way to the publisher. And he had hired a really good photographer that I had watched through the journals. So I wanted to work with him for a year. And I went down there and did that. But it was really missing Alaska. So I came back uh, to Juneau. But interesting enough, Fairbanks had a re legislative reporting class. And I went down there with a bunch of reporters and photographers. And the Juneau Empire just opened up their darkroom because the, the, the staff was taking all the pictures. And they just said, give us a picture every night, every morning. And so I just did that. And then I went skiing at Eagle Crest. I went drinking at the Red Dog. And it was like really fun. And it had been a, a week of sunshine in Juneau. I said, they've been fooling me all this time. I just come from frozen Fairbanks to, to Juneau, where it was warm. And the grass, the, the fields were snowless. But the mountains had plenty of snow. Anyways, fell in love with Juneau. But I had already committed to going um, to Ithaca at that time. And so um, I talked to the managing editor, Carl Sampson, at the time and said, you know, if you ever have a job here, let me know. And he called me about a year later and I was ready to leave Ithaca and I came up here. So that's and so I still hadn't thought about the whale until one November day. I was walking along the docks and, you know, the humpback whale swam into town. And I'm going, oh my God, right here. <laughs> I, you know, they're mostly a summer thing, but this this guy must have got lost on the way out of here or something. And so I'm running on these icy docks, just panting and because I was so excited. And I got my first whale photo Amazing. on my first view. And then I've become kind of a whale junkie. And so we we get good whales in Juneau, as does most of the coast of Alaska. So Okay, how long did it take for you to realize that the weather in Juneau was not always that nice? Oh, <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, I really had a, seven days of sun. It was pretty amazing. That's and a impressive. ski area. And oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, that was impressive. There's been a lot of us who've been hooked on false pretenses. Anyways. Uh, I was I was in Juneau. It, it did. I, I mean, I knew. I was in Juneau at the beginning of the year, and I was... I knew the weather wasn't going to be good, but I was surprised at how not good it was. I did get a couple of sunshiny days, which were lovely, but. <laughs> yeah, you got to put up with it. But when it's beautiful, it's really beautiful. It really is. And um, and what I like about Juno, um, I had an interesting job there. I I was a young man and, and, you know, all I wanted to do was take photos and it didn't matter if I worked 20 hours a day. I. I never put in for all the hours I worked. I just wanted to take pictures. And and you only there was only one photographer. So you were and then it was a six day a week paper. So you were covering, you know, every day except except Sunday, except Saturday when the paper didn't uh, print. There was no and it's a lot of work. You're covering everything. And I was fine with that. And I did that about two years and I was burned out and I had um and they had, were enjoying my me working there. And I said, look, I'm I'm toasted and I want to take a summer off and I'll get you a student intern. And they said, sure, if that works out. And so I was able to get um, summer interns in here. And I'd had most of my summers off for the next, the first two years I worked around the clock and then I had my summers off. And that's when I started doing my kayaking and hiking and 
real adventuring out, outside. But the nice thing about Juno is everything's so close. You have the Mendenhall Glacier, you have bears there, you have goats there, you have county nice there. And then, um, you know, my office now, there's an eagle nest just at my office. Um, I can shoot eagles. Um, it, it's just really accessible to everything that um, a photographer, a wildlife photographer want, want to do. And and um, it's hard to show it on the radio, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, I'm just curious if you, have, like, have, if you have one and, and can tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, one thing is when I got here in 79, the Mendenhall Glacier was quite large. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was going back, you know, 25, 50 feet a year. But it was it's it's back almost two miles from where it was when I got here. And um, it, and as a newspaper photographer, I didn't you know, I, I had these shoots of it all the time because it was it's a grand thing. And it's, and it's just what you shoot. And it's it's the mainstay of, you know. Everything's happening out there. It's cool. There's animals. There's people. And um, somewhere in the early 2000s, it had really gone back fast. And I was going, oh, my um, gosh. I, and so anyways, I had taken this picture from a, 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 a mountain ridge looking over it back in uh, 1986. And then I, in, in the, you know, 1910, 1920, in, in anyways, in 19, um, 26 years later, I took the same picture mm -hmm. and it was stunningly different. And it was like, and it, we, we, we used to camp up on this ridge. It's called Thunder Mountain. And, and that's where we'd go up there and, and hang out and, you know, with our tents and have a beautiful picture of the tents with the mountain in the background and my friends there. And so I went back with the same friends um, 26 years later and documented. And then I went to the university and said, okay, tell me how much this with, you know, with shrinkage had taken place. And he said, well, that's over a mile at the time. And, and, uh, and 800 feet, no, 700 feet of vertical thinning. So the glacier thin 700, 70 stories worth of ice. And it's really a dramatic photo. And it really tells the story. And the story is it started going back three, 400 feet a year and up to like, and and it's just the, the, the rate of its retreat has got so much greater. And if you follow the line of carbon, it goes right up with it. And so um, now it's just a mere fraction of that, but I still like photographing it. I still can make beautiful pictures, but I think that was my, and what was interesting is I got the three people the same. And one guy hair in those 26 years had gone from brown to white. So in the time he went to white, as my hair has gone, <laughs> it the glacier retreated that. So. Um, that's an interesting an interesting comparison to have the person yes. and the glacier to Pretty compare. Sure both. <laughs> yeah. Um it, it maybe we can put a link to those photos um in the notes for this this oh, show. Yeah. We have a we have a webpage with the show and we can put a link to those photos so people can see that because I think oh, that's yeah. probably well, then I could you know and and whales are just whale photography is a super blast here but it it takes so much time that people don't really understand you know like I can go out on a good summer and spend, if I spend 10 days pretty much focusing on whales, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that now. I've been here, this is my 49th year in Alaska. And um, I think I have probably 30 really good whale pictures. So if you take 40 years, times 10 that's 400 days out of the water and you get 30 reasonable portfolio entry level photos yeah it's pretty harsh it's it's mostly sitting there with nothing happening yeah. uh, or just a tail and the tails are fun but after a while it has to be more than that and and i'm actually working with the whale trust maui whale trust um 
they're out of uh, Hawaii and they started a, a nonprofit education scientific whale study thing. Um, and um, I was asked in 2019 to present the Alaska whales because they were taking some of the, because we share the same whales, right. the mod whales, and we call them our whales and they call them their whales. <laughs> and, um, and so I'd been photographing them for, you know, 40 years or plus. And um, they were putting some money. There was some, a couple, four or five years ago, there was a really warm period in the whale distribution was getting kind of weird and no one knew what was happening and so they hired a, a local whale biologist out of Sitka so they were investing some money up here so they thought I, uh, they should uh, have someone present the Alaska whales because their behaviors are so different um, yeah. it's all feeding behavior here and down in, in, in Hawaii of course it's all mating and uh, nursing and birthing and um, so I got to go down there and present and Flip Nicklin, who was the National Geographic photographer, did 20 whale covers. He splits his time in Alaska between um, Maui and Juneau. And he lives okay. on the water, so he watches the whales from his window. And we become friends, and he invited me down to do that. And and so um, that was kind of fun. Um, so, so whale photography, you know, everyone loves whales. But what's interesting is... Um, you can't really go under the water and see them in Alaska because there's so much feed and it's like in the winter when that feed's not around, you have hundred feet visibility. But what, and as photography, you learn all this stuff about whales. And so what makes Alaska and the, the Northern regions of, of the Arctic and then the Antarctic so good, why they come feed here is you have all these rivers dumping all this mineral load into the ocean. And then you have the long photolight period. And then these minerals are held in suspension in cold water longer. And the photolight period, and you have approximately 2000 humpback whales coming to Southeast Alaska eating, no one can tell you exactly how much, but maybe half a ton to a ton of food a day. And, and in like places in Hawaii, they have no long rivers that wash minerals into the thing. The water's warm. They don't have the photo, the long photolite period. So, you know, basically the glaciers are grinding down and they're feeding the whales. Well, they're feeding the whole food chain, starting with the phytoplankton on up. And uh, the whales spend time here. So that was a kind of an interesting understanding. But but it fills the water with a soup and National Geographic has been up here and put critter cams on them. You have like 15 feet of of visibility, so you can't get in underwater with them. So you're you're stuck with what they do above water, and that's mostly tails and breaching. And um, but they do bubble netting here, which is really fun. And and um, it started back. You know, they stopped whaling in '66, and um, it was slowly coming back, bubble netting. But you talk to old fishermen, they didn't see it much because the, the the herd was so small. But um, now it's you can see bubble netting in southeast Alaska almost every day if you're in the right place. And it's spreading up to Kenai. Hmm. The Kenai Fjords, I was up there photographing a little bit. And they, they said bubble netting was pretty sparse. But now in the last three or four years, it's becoming fairly regular. So... Um, it's interesting. So whales have the, been... the connection between the glaciers and the whales is really interesting. I didn't know that. And I think that, I mean, it, wonderful that you have that connection, even with just photography, right? Like that you, you can see kind of all of those, all of those pieces in your work. Well, it, it is really interesting. And, and, you know, Hawaii is famous for its clarity because it has no, all, I mean, if you've probably been to Hawaii, the, the, the rivers are very short. They aren't washing bunches of stuff in there. I mean, you have the Yukon, which is the third largest river in North America. In Southeast Alaska, you have multiple transboundary rivers. I don't know how many rivers you have and how many glaciers, but they're all dumping the nutrients that make the food for the whales. And, yeah, um, interesting. What do you think the hardest part about being a photographer in Alaska is? Because I would imagine that while it's immensely fun, it also is incredibly challenging just given all that we have here well it's access you know yeah. it's, it's really hard 
um, I went into Glacier Bay. The first year I went in there was in 1981. And I think I've spent over a year in Glacier Bay. In the last three or four years, I've been frozen out because I just can't get in there. All my, I don't have a boat anymore. And, and um, I've had some of my best pictures ever. I won the Nash, I won um, a, a picture of a Calvin Glacier with a kayaker underneath it. Um, and one in Alaska magazine, Alaska Airlines magazine back when Alaska Air, and I got two round trips first class for that one. So that was a nice win. Yeah. Um, that came from Glacier Bay. I did a book on Glacier Bay. I've done 10 books on my own and then a couple, two or three in conjunction with other photographers. But um, I've been become, I, when I left the newspaper world, I realized, um, I I realized I, I when I left uh, in '93 is when I left the newspaper world and I started I started my own calendar. I did a book on Juno way back in oh gosh '81. It was a black and white book of my newspaper work, and it's actually had to do with the capital move. Um, mm -hmm. I felt pretty strongly that the capital should stay in Juno, and and. Uh, I had been doing all these pictures for the newspaper. So I put it together and it was during a big capital move vote, I, I think in 82. Um, and the idea was to send these books and I was going to do the book and the mayor bought them and sent them to like all the doctors and dentist offices in Anchorage and Fairbanks. So when they're flipping through it, they could get an idea. And so um, the book sold out basically in Juneau. And, and then I decided, um, my, the managing editor of the Fairbanks paper, Ken Sturgis, opened um, a publishing company in Seattle. He left the newspaper, Epicenter Press. Mm. And um, he did the, um, his most famous book success was Two Old Women. Okay. Have yeah. you read that one? Yeah. I, I don't think I read it, but I, I know of it. Yeah. Well, it was huge. It just went, and anyways... He hired me to do a book on the ferry system. And so I spent uh, most of a summer photographing the ferry system all the way from uh, ADAC all the way down to Bellingham and uh, did a book for him and Sherry Simpson, who was a well-known Alaska writer, both in Anchorage and in Fairbanks. And she worked for the Juno paper for a while, wrote. So how do we get here? Um, I'm kind of losing. Oh, that's okay. I was, well, you were, we were talking about access. Um, that oh, access, access, that's access right, to right. is the hardest part about being a photographer here. Oh, well, like, let's talk about the Annan pictures. So the, that, that portfolio yeah. of pictures from Annan, you're going to have that posted. Yeah. I'll, I'll share a link to that um, in the page, to... in the page for this episode. Um, so on, on the um, website. You know, I'm a, mostly a Southeast Alaska photographer. I spent a lot of time up in all over Alaska, Privilofs, Denali, of course, the Arctic. Um, I've caught, you know, I've packed raft the Conga Cut. I've, you know, I've hiked across the Brooks Range for three weeks. So, but mostly I'm a Southeast guy because, um, and I, I, to tell you the truth, I've never been to McNeil or, or, uh, can't my just because it's so hard to get to and the permit system and everything like that and and I think uh, when I think of bears I I think of them as as uh, forest creatures and in in southeast Alaska they are forest creatures and so um and as great as all the pictures from from Brooks and uh, McNeil are um I want a different look and Annan gave me that look of, and what's amazing about Annan is, you know, all the bears, I, Brooks and McNeil are all brown bears, coastal brown bears. And there's very few rivers in the state. Um, and Annan, it's not really a river, it's a, a creek, it's a stream, uh, supports one of the largest pink salmon, it it's, supports one of the bit largest pink salmon runs in Southeast Alaska, if not in Alaska. And it's just two species uh, streams. So there's black bears and there's coastal brown bears, which is, and they don't mix really well. There's probably 35 to 50 black bears there. 
um, in the drainage and probably you know, 15 to 20 brown bears. Mm -hmm. And when the brown bears are on the river, the black bears leave. The brown bears definitely are, are king. And um, so it gave me an opportunity to shoot both bears, both styles, in the and in a place that wasn't too far away. Easily, you know, a couple hour, well, less than an hour plane ride and a ferry, a day ferry ride. And it's really accessible for me. You can stay in Wrangell and you can take day boats out. And then I, I've done photo tours and, you know, so in all my third, I've been spent 13 years at Annan on, and what you do there is you, you, it opens, it's open between 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then they close it and the forest service manages it. And they have a platform there where everyone walks in, either depending if you're in the cabin, it's a mile long walk. If you come to the beach from Wrangell, it's a half mile walk and you're walking through this great old fork growth forest and you then you come up to this platform you stay there and you know some days if i'm on a boat with a photo tour group i'm only get four or five hours there and then i can i've spent well, four or five days in the cabin by myself or with friends um and so i think in the 13 years i've probably spent probably 30 days there and everyone keeps asking me why would you keep going back to the same spot and when you have 15, you know, potentially 15 brown bears and more black bears than you can count, just stuff happens. And like every picture you see, the 10 pictures there, none of that, none of those pictures lasted more than five minutes and some lasted like 30 seconds. And if I don't even, so you can be on the platform, they don't, don't let you take food. And so I'm there from nine to six, um, with just water, I don't even like to pee because I might miss that 10, center, 10 second interaction that everything happens in. Yeah. And, and, you know, and when you get that many bears, besides, there's always something fun to watch. Bears are just fun to watch. I mean, yeah. if you like them outdoors, it's just like, and then every once in a while, after 13 years, I've come up with 10 pictures that won that portfolio. So you've talking about 30 days and 10 pictures and probably 30,000 pictures taken. And, but it, they're fun. I mean, it's, if, I mean, you might not be making a picture, but you're out there outdoors hanging out with bears for, what is it? Six to nine to six, whatever that is. Yeah. And, well, and then how do you, how do you balance working, always working outside with enjoying the outdoors? Because your work takes place in the outdoors. You enjoy being in the outdoors. Are you always like looking, looking for the next photograph or are you able to also get some time outside where you're just outside to enjoy yourself? I, as I age, I'm enjoying, I'm taking, I still love taking pictures, but I guess I, um, I'm not quite as driven. I, I've had a lot of success. So yeah. um, um, I'm when I used to do photo tours, I used to take hard charging photographers, which I consider myself one of the pictures is the only thing that mattered. And the last three or four years, it's like, ah, uh, photo tours, I rather take people that are just maybe using their iPhones and just want to hang out and be with whatever is happening at the time and not, you know, but it, but yeah, I still work hard out there, but it's it's an attitude attitudinal change of, of yeah. Just, um and and I have a large portfolio. Well, I have a book on all of Alaska. Um and it, it's lots of wildlife, but it, it basically covers what I call the tourist trail. It it sells mostly in southeast Alaska. Um and um and it's sold like 95,000 copies. It's a big coffee table book. Yeah. 180, 160 pages, all my photos. And it's it's how I now support myself as a publisher. And so I wish I was out there as, as much as people think I'm just jumping from mountaintop to mountaintop. That's the, and, you know, the amount of time I spend in the office trying to make these products and get them out to the world compared to the amount I photograph is, uh, I think photography is probably 10% of it. And I think that's an interesting, that's something that I've talked about with other people too, is 
making a hobby your job, right? Like there are good things and bad things about that because you get to do something that you love, but then you have to do less of what you love to make the hobby your job because there's yeah. a lot of back end things. So I think it's it's important for everybody who is like, oh yes, I want to be a photographer. I love taking photos to remember that there's also the business side and all of the back end stuff that maybe isn't quite as much fun as jumping from mountaintop to mountaintop to take photos. You're listening to Outdoor Explorer. I'm your host, Martha Rosenstein. We're going to take a short break and when we come back, we'll continue my conversation with Mark Kelly. You're listening to Outdoor Explorer on Alaska Public Media. Find the show anytime as a free podcast in the iTunes store or connect with us online at alaskapublic.org. back with more Outdoor Explorer. I'm your host, Martha Rosenstein. Listen as we continue our interview with this week's guest, Mark Kelly. And so I, I've been doing calendars. And my first calendar came out in um, 1989 for 19, and sold for the 1990 year. So you're, you're selling it the year before, obviously. Mm-hmm. And um, so now my latest calendar, the 2024 calendar, which will sell in 2023, is is on the market so that's 37 years of cal- of the juno calendar and then i do a alaska calendar that started and that what is takes me to denali and and the rest of the state and kenai that's been out 27 years so that's a lot of a lot of images and how and many I don't re- how many photos I don't re- do you have to take to get 12 photos for a calendar oh gosh you know, my calendar, you know, if you look on, in a year I shoot somewhere, you know, what's interesting is I shoot, I shot more pictures as when I was not digital. So I switched to digital in 206, 207, which is kind of late. Mm-hmm. I was a slide photographer. Okay. And, and um, I shoot a lot less number of pictures as digital. Than I did in slides, and that seems kind of counterintuitive. But when you had a slide, you had one thing, right? And it wasn't infinitely multiple. You couldn't just multiple multiply it forever. It was harder to manipulate. You can't manipulate the image as much it's, as you can with a digital. No, image. no, no. The in the image. So if I had just the one perfect image, I can't. I can oh. only. Yes, I, it, oh, I I want to keep it here for my books. Yes. But the publisher wants to do it over here. And and so you need seven copies digital, of the same image. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so if I shoot it, um so I shoot a, a whole lot less. Interesting. Um, uh, but I still have like ninety-five thousand pictures on the computer, which is and I don't you know, I'm in my lifetime I'm gonna publish two or three thousand of them. So I don't yeah. know what I have 95. But yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. And so um so in a year I'll I'll probably shoot two to five thousand images, but you know, then I whack them down or, or I try to whack them down pretty hard to just and then I just pull the cream of it and and um for the calendars, which is an ongoing thing, but then I have postcards, I have note cards, I have photo magnets, I have four books that I'm continually upgrade updating. And are you doing for your calendars? Are you doing like is the 2024 calendar going to be all photos that you shot in 2023? Or oh, no, 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 no. Okay. It's 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 just a collection. Some pictures have. Been, take four or five years to work their way into the calendar okay. just because yeah. I have enough that year like I always try to get an eagle picture or a bear picture or a whale picture and if if that year I had really good luck with whales and I have three or four potential calendar pictures they'll sit and get moved in upgraded to the calendar um but I always am feeling short 
on pictures because they they I want them to be as good as as good as they can be. Yeah. So uh -huh. um, so anyways, getting back to Ann, and if we can, yeah. uh, it's a long time awaiting, and and the patience it takes to be a photographer is hard to understand. Um, I can't imagine. I mean, I mean you're waiting, you're waiting say, all day for the shot. Right, and it's it's I I one of my best pictures, which ended up as the cover of National Wildlife, was was so so I come from a photojournalism background. And so I'm always looking for the quintessential storytelling pictures. And so when you think of the Tongass, you think of it as a rainforest, you think of it as uh, the apex predators of the bear, and the spruce tree is uh, the number one tree. And so I end up at Annan, and I was down, the uh, Annan, you have a, a, a stream level view of the bears and, and in a blind. And then you walk up the stairs in the major platform and there's only six people allowed in the blind. And I was there with some friends. I was down the blind and we have a, a, a code that if something's really good, you and you go down and get the person the blind too. And so they were gracious enough to leave this great shoot and get me up there. And it came became the cover of National Wildlife and it was in the portfolio. Um, and so... It said, it, I think it's the best picture to talk about the Tongass. It's pouring rain, just dumping rain. You can see all the drips on the the, the spruce needles and the branches, the bears soaking wet, and the bears stand on all fours in a tree. And then you can see that, so there's the apex predator standing in a spruce tree, and behind it is the whole forest um, unfolding. And it's just like, that's what the Tongass is. It's a rainforest full of bears and wet and trees. And soggy, and, yeah, soggy trees. Soggy, soggy trees. And what's interesting is when you are on a platform and the bear, sometimes the bears are very close um, and they get in a tree. And if you shoot straight up, it's this weird angle. It doesn't make it look right. So when everyone moved up to the rail, I moved back because that lowers the angle. So you in in that portfolio you see sleeping bears in trees, you see mom and cubs in trees, and it looks like you're at the ground level with the same level. How do you do that? By moving farther back, you cut that angle instead of moving forward and looking up like that, it distorts the view. And mm -hmm. so um, I was able to to use that little bit trick I learned at Annan after being there for so many years. Yeah. Don't move up, move back and use longer lenses. Well, and, and that's, is that something that has also, I mean, you, it's, it sounds like a wonderful place and a, and a place that gets, has, is beautiful to go, but is that something that allows, that makes you want to return to a place time and time again, is you learn something from the last time you were there and you want to take a similar photo, but better because you learned if you step back, you can get this right. photo better. Absolutely. So that's, that's what takes you there over and over again. As you stay in a place, you learn more and more about the place. You learn how, and, and bears are, you learn where the hot spots are, where they're fishing, and and uh, you can, yeah, you, you, you just, you can, after two or three days there, the bears do the same sort of stuff, and, you know, they fight, and but they usually don't fight to the point of, I mean, every once in a while, they draw blood, but mostly they're just, you know, force you know territory have territorial disputes and and uh, you know you get gnashing teeth and stuff and um it's all in in that portfolio you see that and there's yeah. it's all about i mean they're, they're so human-like i mean you, you if they portray this you know this very touching moment with a a, a lost bear in the cub tree and, and the mom finding and they're touching their noses and that whole thing had though i wish i could show them the whole sequence of the the baby bear lost and went up the tree and was bawling and the mom was down the creek. What they do is they, adult bear, male boars will kill cubs. Right. Um, and so, but the mom has to feed. And um, so they usually shoo them up a tree and are very kind of nervous about being down there, but they have to do that. And this one bear and the cub knew to go up in the tree and was just bawling its head off and the mom came rushing back and 
everything got good and you know it's just full of the same emotions of people and, and it's just and, and you know no one's ever been attacked at Annan. it's been a bear protected bear spot for gosh I, since my kids were young and um and you're really close i mean i have you stand so i have a bear walk by me on a bridge where its fur touched me you know and it's it's like yikes you're on a bridge and the bear's coming you just they're yeah. they're very used to people yeah you know they're, they're wild but you know and the bears are well fed and you know there's been a lot of close encounters and or bear will fall asleep on the trail and you just sit there. I can remember sitting there for almost an hour watching a mom and two cubs sleep. <laughs> Didn't make a photo, but <laughs> yeah, an interesting experience. So um. well, and I think I think that's something that is very like living this close to animals. Even if you're not, you know, that's not where you live, but you visit that place repeatedly. Being that close to wild animals is something that's pretty uniquely Alaskan. Honestly, like I have a moose that lives in my yard right now. It's been here for two weeks. It is not. It it's perfectly it knows my voice now you know if, if I when I let my dogs out like it's it's not afraid it's just is doing its moose thing but we've sort of come to accept each other and we're all we're all okay with each other and it knows that my dogs are not going to bother it and it's fine to just stay where it is but I think that's something that's just uniquely Alaskan that you don't you don't realize until you don't you talk to people who have never had experiences like that yeah well bears it can be a pretty scary thing in in, in the the world of you know the guy who does all the bear tales all the bear maulings but it, it's like shark maulings and, and you know it happens but it's you know a place like annan which has been they let 60 people a day go there from starting with fourth of july till the end of august and i think they've sprayed bears maybe three or four times you know the guides all carry guns no yeah. no bear has ever been shot I don't I, I can't remember hearing of any and so it it's really a really copacetic place I mean everyone's the bears are happy you're happy and and nothing knock on wood has ever gone really wrong there so they're very acclimated I guess uh, to people Mm -hmm. but they're still very wild right and you, that's that's hard to that's hard to describe to somebody who's never experienced that being near a wild animal that's wild but also knows that you're not going to bother it right yeah and just accepting it and, and so and it's, it's you know Wrangell is one of my favorite places to go because they have Ann Ann mm -hmm. and they have um the Sakine River which is a major transboundary river um and they have a great glacier up there and then they have a, a, a conch glacier around the corner which is uh, the southernmost um tidewater glacier in north america okay. and they have great seal populations there they have um there's in southeast alaska this is the stuff you pick up as being a nature photographer there's three main pupping areas for seals so if you and you need to know that may and june is the pupping season so if you want to get cute pups on the ice you want to be there in May or June, and the three places to go to is, is Sawyer Glacier in in outside of Juneau. It's a day boat ride out, or Lacan, which is harder to get to. You can get to from Petersburg or Wrangell, and then Glacier Bay, um, John Hopkins, and those are where the main seal areas are. And and um, so you time your life to. Well, I like to get some new seal pictures. So I know in May, I'm, you know, it's a day trip out of Juno. I'll be in Tracy Island for a day or two. Um, and one of the pictures I took there won second place in National Wildlife um, Magazine contest about two or three years ago for um, baby bear, bear, baby, baby animals. So it was a, a relationship between a mom and a, and a, a pup. And it, I mean, Alaska is just full of that stuff. Yeah. And, and access is all about that. And, you know, a day trip out of Juneau would take you to Tracy Arm. You get great cabin glaciers and you get seals. And, but same thing in, in Kenai Fjords. I spent, went back there this year for three or four days. You get lots of seals and you get sea otters, more sea otters. We don't have a lot of sea otters here. Um, yeah. In, in, well, we do in Southeast, but not in the Juno area. They haven't gotten this far yet. Yeah. Um, 
So I think as a wildlife nature photographer, one of the things I do in the presentations I give is I do my morning commute to work. And so I, I, I'm fortunate enough to have a house on the beach and we watch whales and stuff. And um, mostly it's, I have a beautiful set of Chilkat Mountains across and the sunsets are great. And so I, um, I start and I give a log like a quarter mile in is where I took a, a bear picture. And it's a little baby bear and the dandelions are like three feet high and this little baby bear. And then I move on and it's another quarter mile is I'm looking across Auk Bay into these beautiful mountains with light and got a picture of that. And then a, another two miles, I'm in Auk Bay, which has this beautiful boat harbor with the mountains. And then I come to Auk Lake and I have this amazing picture of neuron lights over at Auk Lake. And then I have this amazing picture in the summer of um, the flowers of the the Lupin and the lake and the Mendenhall Glacier in the background. And then right across from that is the eagle's nest that I photograph. And then I go um, out to the Mendenhall River, which this is all in seven miles. Right. Um, I have this amazing field of fireweed and, and the Mendenhall Glacier and then rafters coming down there. And then another mile I'm at my office and there's an eagle nest tree there. So and you don't even a, have to you don't have to go anywhere to take your photos. Everything is within 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. Eagles, bears, glaciers. It's it's pretty spectacular. Yeah. It's um, very lucky. Yeah. I should I should maybe forward you my commute pictures. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Let me write myself a note on that. Um yeah. I, I never really thought about it, but I always, you know, I drive it every day to go to my office and I'm going. Who else sees this sort of stuff on their commute? You should turn that into a book. I bet people would be really <laughs> into you know, your morning commute. <laughs> My morning commute. You could make it into a kid's book. <laughs> <laughs> I did a kid's book. Yeah. It was really fun. I, yeah. have, to, I have to send you one. Um, give me your address. I'll send you the, my, the, the main book, my, my big coffee table book. Okay. I, and I'll send you the kids' book. It was the poultry was written by Nick Jans. Nick Jans oh. has written most of my books now. Mm -hmm. um, he's a dear friend, and uh, of course, he's a really well published Alaskan author. And we, over the years, um, become just he does my work books. Yeah, and, that's... and he and so I was as a child and as an adult very dyslexic. Um, I survived dys dyslexia. It, it was challenging as a young person. And uh, I think as I grow older, it, uh, it, is, it is a gift, really, because you just, most photographers I talk to are dyslexic. I was going to ask if you think that's maybe why you were drawn to to a, a visual a visual arts versus maybe being a writer or something else, you know, with uh, words. It, it, you know, I mean, when I was a young boy and I had um, a speech impediment and I had dyslexia and and when I was going into kindergarten, first grade, believe it or not, <clears throat> I, it's hard to say, but they had a retard room. They called it a retard room. And it's just so unacceptable now. And yeah. they were going to put me in the retard room. And my parents said, no. You know, he's, he can't, we, excuse me, this is bad. Um, They said, uh, you know, you might not understand him, but we understand fine that he has a, a, a speech problem and he's not stupid. He, he, he just can't read and he can't write his numbers. And, right. you know, and they, they had to, the, I tested fine and, and, um, but I've dealt with it, and 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 in, and in reading about it, I I, I consider it a, a gift now because um, when I was young, Life Magazine. I'm not sure you're probably too young to know of Life Magazine. It was oh, I, a, I I think I remember Life Magazine. It was a weekly that came out, and I knew what day that would be delivered at my at my house, and mm -hmm. I was almost waiting for it, and I couldn't read the words, but I could read the pictures, and. Um, and it's been my whole life of reading pictures. I actually think I have this theory of um, how do we think? And and I think we I think in pictures. I don't think 
in words. I don't know. Do you do you see when you see a dog? Do you see a dog or do you see dog? I I. It's, I think for me, it depends. It's, it depends on, I see more in pictures than words, I think, but it depends on what it is because if it's not something that I have a picture for, then I probably don't see the picture. Yeah, well, um, and then I think, you know, I don't really do video. I do stills because I think of the power of stills mm -hmm. and are much more powerful and much more memory. I think we think we remember in stills. I mean, all the, I mean, and I do this whole thing. I have a lecture and this is, I've never talked to a psychologist, but I, I, I will put up a picture of, oh, some pictures from Vietnam of like the, the guy assass uh, shooting the one that won the Pulitzer Prize mm -hmm. and, and people of that age and most that's become a kind of universal picture. Yeah. Every, I can just speak about it and you know, the picture I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Well, that was film. That was it was on the news reels or not, you know, on the NBC nightly news, right. but that has long been forgotten or the famous pictures of the Hindenburg, you know, mm -hmm. you can see those, mm -hmm. but that was all filmed too. Mm -hmm. And I show all these pictures that were filmed. And, and then like the, um, the, the challenger blew up. You, you remember those pictures? Yep. Yep. Those were the, the still, the, the still image was taken from a video. Mm -hmm. You can see that still image, but right. I don't think you remember the video. Right. I don't think I've probably ever seen the video. I've, I think I've probably only ever seen still the images. Still, right. Yeah. And so I, all my best memories are, you know, the picture, my wonderful moments with my wife, they're all still images. It's not a video. Yeah. So I think a, a strong still is, still the most powerful thing you can have and so i don't want to waste it's not waste i love the videos i love movies don't don't get me wrong but i don't think they have the lasting impact that a, a still image so i don't do video um because in that video well now the video is getting so good that you could crop a picture out but i like right. i like <clears throat> so anyways that's my take on uh, on photography and the importance of it and why I stick yeah. with it and how much I, the power of it. Um, yeah. And um, that's, like National Geographic, the woman, the woman, I think, from Pakistan, the cover of the most famous, you, you know, I'm just start talking about the woman on that, that mm -hmm. that's been around forever. And I, I keep looking at that picture and wondering why, what makes that picture so powerful and, and why does all the millions and millions and billions of pictures we see of people. Why is this one kind of risen to the top? Yeah. Um, and I, I don't have an explanation for it, but it's very powerful stuff. Exactly. Yes, it is. Um, so it's much harder. I, I have lots of young people who come who want to be photographers and come to me and say, how do you do this? I'm going, it's almost impossible. It's, yeah, um, I would imagine. I mean, you you kind of had you got into it at the right time. You had like kind of some luck, not lucky. You take wonderful photos, so I that I don't want to discredit the no. photos, but you had some lucky breaks that really got you to be able to do what you're doing today. I think. And yeah, I think when I first lucky. got to Juno in '79, there were like a hundred thousand cruise ship passengers. Right. And and now this year they're predicting one point six million, which million. just seems yeah it seems unfathomable um how that is going to work yeah uh, and you know my my publishing has grown with the industry so i'm i'm a tourism guy now yeah. and, and luckily the images i like to take the bears the whales the seals the glaciers mesh perfectly mm -hmm. with what the people are coming here to see and it's not yeah. like i'm shooting something because I think it's commercially going to be successful. I right. shoot because this is what I like, and it's also commercially. It happens. Successful. It happens to be commercially successful it, it, as well. It, yeah. it blends really well. Yeah, I, I don't go shoot green grass with a flower in it. I mean, I, <laughs> it's, it's all very predictable, but hopefully done well, beautifully yeah. shot. That's so, important. Martha, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so pleasure. much for talking to me.
That's all for today's show. Thank you to my guest, Mark Kelly. You can learn more about Mark and his work on his website, markkelly.com. A quick note on last week's show, my co-host Lisa Keller interviewed Tom Walker, author of The Wanderer, An Alaska Wolf's Final Journey. Tom will be speaking at Eagle River Nature Center on June 16th at 6.30 p.m. and signing books at Tidal Wave Books the following day on June 17th from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. You can find more information about our guests and any links we mentioned on the Outdoor Explorer page at alaskapublic.org. Thank you to our producer, Eric Bork, and from all of the hosts here at Outdoor Explorer, thank you for listening, and we'll see you outside. Outdoor Explorer is a production of KSKA Public Radio in Anchorage, Alaska. Theme music is by Portugal, the man. Views expressed are those of the participants and do not reflect the station or its underwriters. You can find Outdoor Explorer on Facebook and in your favorite podcast app. To see what's coming up on Outdoor Explorer and add your voice to the conversation, go to our website at alaskapublic.org. Life Informed. This is Alaska Public Media. I don't know what it is, but you gotta do it. I don't know where to go, but you gotta be there. I don't know where to fall, but I know that it's comfortable. Made me lose my performance